Hi, everybody. This is Brenda Daly, and this is Real Women Celebrating Women in Film. I am your host. I'm very excited because we're trying to change up the the uh, patterns of our, our show. And th today we have three fantastic women, women empowerment, that are filmmakers, which is very exciting to me. We actually had somebody come back, and she was very excited to introduce her friends. Uh, they are they just finished a film called Chasing the Ghost. And there's special effects and there's a lot of work that goes into film. And I feel like these women are a team and we're all about teamwork as filmmakers. So I really want to introduce you to them. Um, hello, ladies. How are you? Come on in. Good. Thanks for having us. Oh, I was so excited that you got a hold of me because I feel like uh, you... Well, of course, being women, you all get this. And I think that, you know, we're in an industry where women are starting to become more and more powerful. And I feel like, you know, we are definitely the powerful people here. And this is an empowerment show for women. So I wanted you guys to introduce yourself individually. Okay, great. Well, I'll go ahead and start. Um, my name is Tennille Taraskevich, and I was um, one of the executive producers and also had a supporting role of Angel in Chasing the Ghost. And then we also have with us our makeup artist, Candice. Hi, nice to meet you, everybody. My name is Candice Fowler. I am the key makeup artist of Chasing the Ghost. Yes, and then Calhoun. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Calhoun Koenig, and I play the role of Becky in Chasing the Ghost. Well, it's so exciting to have you here, ladies. I just feel like uh, it. you sure make those movies fast, Tennille. That's all I have to say. So how long were you in production for? So we had um, 11 days on set. So we did it in 11. And I would have to say the speed and rate of everything is um, really associated with the other executive producers. So um, Tennille T Productions, this time teamed up with uh, Dennis Reed II Productions or DR2 Productions. And he has a very strong relationship um, with Tubi. And so he's elevated himself to a point where he's doing one or more projects a month. So that's actually how I met Candace is she is one of his standard key makeup artists. And so um, she really had a hand at bringing Angel to life for Chasing the Ghost. And uh, yeah, just a really, uh, you know, a strong presence in the, the Detroit area film, uh, you know. Okay, so tell me the basic story, like, you know, and... Five minutes or less so that we can go yeah. on. <laughs> so I don't want to say everything because I know that we could get into that because we've had an interview before. So I'm actually going to punt this question to Calhoun because she okay. was in in the midst of the, the story. So maybe Calhoun, if you want to give your spin and then, um, you know, and then Candace or I can add to it. Yeah, sure. I, I, I'll, I'll sure try my best. Uh, so I, I, it follows the main guy, Clay, who's, you know, a family man who also works at a hospital. At the very beginning, he makes a huge mistake because of his drug usage and his family kind of is like, all right, we're sending you to a rehab center. Um, and so he goes off. But before that, he's actually cursed. So every day that he isn't high or on some kind of substance, a family member of his dies. Um, and so he's kind of losing his mind at the rehab center. And uh, that's where he meets me, Becky. I'm kind of like, I'm not crazy, but I'm definitely a bit of a, I'm definitely ostracized a little bit because I'm, I'm definitely kind of crazy for my age, I suppose. Um, and his character and I have a, a series of very in entertaining interactions and I end up kind of, kind of saving him from an overdose. Um, but long story short, the curse kind of unfurls its wings and a bunch of crazy stuff happens. And, and yeah, it, it's a very, it's a very family driven story about addiction. And I think a lot of the times with stories like that, it's all about the actual usage, but I feel like this, this production has a more bird's eye view of, of the situation and how drugs can influence others as well. So this is a, a drama. It's a thriller slash drama. It, it's it's both. But 
it definitely, um, I think Calhoun hit like all the, the key points of this story. So wonderful job being put on the spot there. I think what she talked about at the end was kind of our bigger purpose though, which is really looking at drug addiction as a curse. So when you guys, uh, I don't know who wrote the script, but when you guys did the script, where did you guys talk about, like, did you partner up with any rehab centers to kind of let them know what you guys were doing? No, actually, we did not. Um, The writer, right, wrong, or indifferent, um, has struggled with addiction himself. And so I think that he was, you know, writing from, like, a place of trueness. Um, And and what's the name of the writer? um, He's the same writer for If I Can't Have You, uh, Matt Santia. And he also... I uh, co-wrote it with Calvin, uh, Todd Calvin DePew. So this okay, I just wanted to make sure they got a shout out. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So they were co-writers and then Matt was, was the director again, uh, same director of, if I can't have you. So, um, so how, long was, how long was it from uh, pre-production to production? Yep. So we, so basically this script was written from scratch. So we, um, had our first meeting in like November of last year. We started um, writing out log lines immediately. We had about seven of them to give to Dennis. And we thought that the the um, the addiction curse thing was good because Dennis has never done a thriller. And so this is stopping kind of outside of his box. And so he wanted something that had kind of a Jordan Peele feel to it. So kind of flipping it on its head. So this is looking at, um, I think addiction in a completely different way. And, um, and again, really looking at it from more of a a supernatural thriller perspective and, you know, adding that element of the curse. So when you guys got involved with Candace and she became your key makeup artist, I just want to make sure everybody gets, you know, an understanding that that, you know, a key makeup artist can make or break your film. Um, I know that we when we did uh, bullets and stuff. They tried to do it in post and it just looked terrible and I had to take them all out. So I, I do understand that, you know, being a makeup artist, you know, not only do you have to make people either look good, beautiful, terrible. You also have to make those moments when you're doing special effects makeup so that when they're in the editing room, they can make it look real and because if it doesn't look real, audience is pretty sm- pretty smart, and it's on this big, huge screen. Even yeah. even if it's on your eighty inch home TV, you know, and it doesn't look right, everybody's going to go, Candace. So, Candace, okay. how did you approach that? <laughs> okay, let's say this for starters. They play they pay close attention, so. I was definitely in a hot seat, and one thing I can say is to Neil and Matt, definitely tested my gangster when it came to makeup, um, down to the techniques, to the details. I absolutely enjoyed every moment of the set. I, I appreciate, you know, just the, just the, you know, the difference in what I had to do. So, like, I've never done so much techniques, like little details, and it really brought the film to life. Um so yeah, it was it was definitely a uh, as a makeup artist, you know, you're you're working under the production uh, artist mm-hmm. manager, and so you know it's always the production uh, management's job and artistry, the creative producers artistry to make sure that they have a good communication with the makeup artist and make sure that the sets always look a certain way and so that everything kind of matches. Mm-hmm. So how so what was the name of your uh, creative producer? Or was it just Matt and Tanil? It, it was really it was Matt and I. Yeah. Yeah. So what um, what I kind of helped with is helping her know her timing on set. So, uh-huh. you know, each day we knew um, which people were going to have special effects makeup and then letting her know how much time. And then um, I think that... Uh, Matt was really good at giving each of the actors examples of overdoses that they could mm-hmm. emulate. Because that's what the curse did is it, is it killed people with symptoms of an overdose. Oh, okay. And so, and so that was a lot of her special effects makeup, um, you know, was was giving people kind of that that depth 
look. And then definitely um, the character of Angel, um, she did a phenomenal job just making <laughs> Thank her you. look like a character. So, so yeah, so that was like, she was more of the lighter side of the movie where she kind of helped, but yet she was kind of the almost the sidekick, right? It was like we brought all three of us, our, our brought our visions together. So uh -huh. like more like I got what their vision was of things. And then, okay, I put my vision to it and kind of like made it a little twist. So it was like a three in one combo. <laughs> and it was well, only like building. You, oh, yeah, it sounds like you ladies will all work again together because that's, you know, I think what you find a great team, it's really hard to like alleviate from that, that team. And so Calhoun, I wanted to know is uh, besides Chasing the Ghost, what other films have you been in? Um, uh, a number. Uh, when I first started out in film, I was kind of doing e every single project I could take just to kind of build a resume. Um, and I kind of, I made, I made a lot of really amazing connections in the Michigan film community. Um, in more recent years, I've been kind of focusing on expanding my network a little bit. I've worked a number of, on a number of productions in Albuquerque at this point. Um, I was out in LA for a little while, Atlanta, all around the Midwest. Um, but more, I mean, I met Sunil on, a, oh shoot, uh, Auto Autolysis. Autolysis. Yes. yes. On what? Um, on a film called Auto Autolysis. It was like a little short film. So that's where oh, okay. we met. Okay. Um, but Dennis, the other producer, I've known him since I was, I think, 12. Like, he was one of the very first Michigan film people that I got to work with. So it, it was cool to kind of, like, bring everything together on this film and have a lot of familiar faces. So how old are you? I'm you 20. Oh, you're yeah, 20. I'm okay. 20. You look very young. <laughs> you definitely look very young. So <laughs> as far as the film is concerned, like, what are the key things that you want your audience to know about this film that are the most important little bits from each of you uh, that matter. I know the drug addiction and family living through dark drug addiction, but like, you know, what are those moments that make your heart kind of go, Ugh, you yeah. know? Yeah. I, I think that um, relatability and helping, you know, people feel connected, I would say is, is the bigger theme um, I definitely feel like people that have watched the film so far, the feedback is like, it's relatable. Like everybody knows somebody that is, is struggling with, with some sort of addiction. And so, um, I think that there was just this empathy and understanding, you know, with the, the deeper message that was, was being said. So I know that does kind of tie back to the, the drug addiction, but I think it's the relatability and not feeling ashamed. Um, yeah. I think too, with you, when you're dealing with an issue like drug addiction, um, everybody has a family member that's dealt with it. You know, I think that, you know, as far as the, it's a very good subject to touch on to because I think we've all been touched by that in one way or another. And, you know, it, whether it's your family, a friend's family, it's usually, there's usually one in every family because I think the real horror, like when we talk about horror thrillers, the real horror is that um, that's something you can't really see right away. So somebody's really, yeah. really gotten to the edge. And of course, um, I do believe that people are talking more about it. So I'm hoping that, you know, we get less and less of that. That's why I was thinking that it's just in my brain. I don't know how you guys are distributing it besides Tubi, but uh, in my brain, I keep thinking that would be something that you could almost go to a rehab center. They would probably enjoy a film like that. And then right. you know, yeah, for sure. Right. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely, I think there is a strong, you know, public service message and actually at the end um, right now it's actually the director's cut that's, that's, um, streaming on, on Tubi, but when the producer's cut gets, um, reloaded, we actually moved up the PSA ahead of the credits because, you know, once it's streaming, it cuts off, you know, at a certain point. And so it really, it, it literally does say, you know, addiction is a curse when you're ready to break it, call mm -hmm. this number. And I so, love that. so I think that, 
you know, because a lot of it is for sort of entertainment value. So I definitely feel like Calhoun's character, she really embodied kind of like that euphoria generation. So just, you know, the young, crazy, just give it to me. I don't care what it does to me. Like I, I'm going on this ride. And so there's so much that seems like it's being taken lightly. But um, but yeah, we we definitely... I think that that's a very good point when you were saying about a Calhoun's character, just for the sure fact is in this, the world that we live in, I feel like with the internet and everything, it just speeds everything up. So they're living in this stress. I mean, everything's so stressful that, you know, it's like, you know, we'll just take a pill, you know, I mean, that's pretty much our society. And I think that it was very good that you ladies uh, kind of touched on that. So uh, Candace, you, so one thing I can say I really loved about the family support, the family and friends support. They didn't just leave him in the dark. You know what I'm saying? So that really stuck out to me. I really do suggest that the viewers do pay attention to the little details because um, this is a type of film where you really have to pay attention for the story to really make sense. Mm -hmm. So the family and the support thing is what really stuck out to me. Mm -hmm. So how long has the movie been on online? It's been, what, about a week or a um, So it, it started, so yeah, it started streaming kind of earlier than we were expecting. So I think it went up November 5th, but we didn't really start promoting it until about a week later. And we're okay. still, you know, slowly ramping up our promotion plan because I, I know that uh, Dennis. We need to talk it. about this soon because I'm actually, um, I'm a marketer for geofencing and geotargeting. And so what we do is we actually target people. It And, and I think it, it hasn't been done for films, but I know we've done it for like political ads and everything, but literally you can take your audience. And so, because in order for the filmmakers to get paid, they need eyeballs on that movie. Right. So Absolutely. you can literally go to a conference, let's say it's AFM. I don't yeah. know if it's AFM, but let, you can go to a conference and we can geofence the whole conference. And then you you could be at that conference and you could be sending them your trailer. Got it. Okay. So, the, so and then of course you can do that also with audience. So we'll talk about that later. Yeah. But yeah. I wanted to know, uh, uh, you know, so how did you guys distribute? Did you guys go through? Uh, film hub or did you have an actual distributor i mean how did you do that yeah so what's really ironic and actually super convenient is um uh homestead entertainment um takes on all of dr2 productions and okay. so we were you know under that umbrella so not that it was pre-sold but it was you know it already had a slot if that makes sense well yeah because they have a relationship yeah yeah, uh, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. A, a trusting yeah. relationship. I think yeah. that's, that's sort of thing. I'm actually trying to get my movie in distribution, but I don't really have that kind of relationship. I'm still reaching out and trying to find it. So, but I do. Look, <laughs> I'll tell you what. I will send it to you, ladies. I'll send you my yeah. package, package, and then you guys can tell me. Maybe, maybe you guys can help me adjust it because I feel like you're very. uh You've been doing this a little bit longer than me as far as distribution. So I would love to send that to you. Uh, to yeah, you. absolutely. So I wanted to ask Calhoun, what really made you gravitate to this character? Um, I mean, honestly, the first calling card was the fact that Matt Santee was directing. Um, <laughs> well, that's always was, a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> he was one of like the producers, I believe, on the film I mentioned previously, Autolysis. Um, and, you know, we had gotten to chatting behind the scenes. And since then, I'd like seen his work as an actor. And, you know, just the more I observed him and the more that I like saw him around, I really built a sense of, of, of respect for his work. Like he's, he's a really I think anyone on this production or anyone who has worked with him will say very confidently that he is just like an artist at heart just yes. the, the the depth he goes with every single character because at the end of the day like my role is a notable role but it's pretty small <laughs> but he had you know he made me a playlist like he gave me like oh this color palette is something that I really associate with your character um and it was really exciting to get to collaborate with him um at, with him in a, in a director's position um because I knew we would just click really well because that's very much how I would like to think that I approach things as well. Um, but when it comes to the actual character, it was kind of fun to see it evolve because originally I was like, oh, 
dude, Becky's crazy. Like, what the heck? This will be so fun. You know, I get to scream at this lady to give me drugs. I get to do all these things. Um, right, I think, but there's always, you know, no one's, I think I just watched uh, Death to Me with Christina Agil- or, or Christina Applegate. And it's like, that's the worst thing you could, you never, you never call anybody crazy because we're all a little bit of crazy. <laughs> right, exactly. And that's, we're all a little bit of everything. So in order yeah. for her to get to the point where she's doing drugs, there's got to be something much deeper going on. Th- that's exactly that- what I was getting to where it's like, Whereas, like, at first glance, it's like, oh, this is crazy. Let's go. And then, you know, the the deeper I got into developing that character, like, I created this whole backstory for her where it's like, oh, you know, her mother had drug issues. Her mother overdosed. And she ended up going to her mother's drugs, like the leftovers, as a way to cope with her emotions. And, you know, how well, that kind of tumbled norm. into this. You this, know, it was literally normal for her. If it was around right. and her mother was doing it, mm-hmm. she lived a whole, she grew up in in the normality of drugs are okay, no matter what the media says. If mom's doing it, right? And and you know, and uh, <laughs> and and seeing that snowball into this very at first seemingly very flippant, like I don't really care about life kind of character, but deep down there, there are sensitivities about her that I. I began to really, really appreciate. Um, and, and I came to really enjoy playing Becky overall. Yeah, and the thing is, is that, I mean, I'm a character actor, so I don't think there's any small roles. I think it's what the role you're right for, because, I mean, it, had they written it differently, it might have been the other way around. But because the thing about playing a character like you played is that you're a key character, because mm-hmm. you're the one who's kind of dragging out the information of what's really going on. Mm-hmm. And... It's funny because when you watch a movie and you say, oh, it's a small role, I have people say that, oh, well, it was only a small role. It's like, yeah, but if your role wasn't there, then the rest of the movie doesn't go. If you don't right. bring to the character what it is that you bring, then there's there, it, your character has to be there. Otherwise, why write it? Mm-hmm. Right? You know? For sure. So, uh, yeah. So, and uh, so, Candace, I also wanted to ask you is what was the most difficult for you as far as doing the special effects makeup? Um, hmm. I'm not gonna say anything was like difficult, but I'm just gonna say it was stages of understanding <laughs> Angel. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> she was like this quirky, witchy, like creepy individual. And um, when it came to the part that when she overdosed, I remember me and Sunil, we met up and we wanted to go over the look and it was totally different. But did. it evolved. But it, that's what yeah. I said. it evolved. So we had like our test makeup and it looked creepy. But then she put this whole new spin on it as she was like seeing it and feeling mm-hmm. it. And we were in a very notable place filming when she did that makeup. There was a lot of charged energy. Um yes. Eloise Asylum. And it's basically like this place that hasn't been occupied for over 30 years. And so oh, there's wow, that's cool. all this really interesting energy, um, you know, that was there, but man, she was like on point and was just like, Oh, let's do this. Let's do this. And it, it went from just kind of like this dirty overdose look to this like character, if that makes sense. So, you know, it totally makes sense. And, and so as a filmmaker, I totally understand that because it's funny because, you know, you can spend all the time in the world in pre-production, which is great because you always have to have a plan. Yeah. But I think, you know, for me, it's like I have all these shots planned or, or I'll make a shot list. And I don't think I ever use the shot list. I think it makes my mind plan it. But yeah. then if I'm in the moment and it's like, oh. Yeah, this would look yeah. so good right now. Right. Or like I'm gonna piggyback off of um, what Tanil said. So I think it was like the setting for me, like being in because I've never listened. I never thought I would step foot on <laughs> this place. It was so creepy, so creepy, and I think it was just the setting that kind of just got had my mind just generating. Like, okay, this is we're gonna go full throttle with it. Yeah. Wow, that's great. So, what was the budget of this film? I'm so the budget originally was like 85, but with inflation, because yeah, even just food, food, (laughs) yeah, even just you know, when I did itchy, it was ten dollars per person per meal, 
now you're lucky if you can get 15. So, so yeah, there were de was definitely some inflation. So I'm going to estimate, um, you know, with, with our combined expenses, probably close to 90, 95. Yeah. It's, it's always more. I always think when you do yeah. a budget, you should know what the budget actually is. Yeah. And maybe even add a third to it because then there's all those uh, promotional fees. And, yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, we all tend to, and, and inflation's, and food can really, you got to feed a crew. Yeah. That's, that's like, I think probably the biggest challenge of all. <laughs> yeah, it's angry. Is, yeah, it is. It is a much bigger challenge, but we were super happy or fortunate. So the first three days I kind of had to manage it um, by myself, but then um, one of the actresses moms is really good at doing that kind of stuff. And so for a few days, I mean, she had us like so well taken care of. We were getting hibachi bowls and burrito bowls, and you so know. So, what's her the, name? Her name is Melinda Bryce. And okay, so I just wanted to give Melinda a shout out because yes, it is so yes. important to have that person, it and is. especially if you're the filmmaker, because you have that. You know, you have that support, and mm -hmm. and you know they they love what they're doing, and they're just excited to be part of the film, and but they're. They're very intricate because, yeah, I think Candace said it. You don't want your crew and cast to be hangry. Right. She <laughs> became my mama on set. Sure. She's my mama. Yeah, yeah no, like she that. was amazing. Yeah, she <laughs> did, like, all these iced coffees because we were filming in the summer and, you know, trying to get people still that caffeine. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, she just she did all these little small things that added up to really, I think, just meet everybody's needs. Cause you know, you know, like being on set, there's so many different diets and things like that. So the way that she was able to organize, it was like so customized and everybody felt like they had what they needed. I so feel like she has a new career ahead of her. She's well, you know what? She's actually an accomplished writer. Oh, you know, okay. I think she was just doing that because Matt and her, because uh, Matt, the writer director and, and her are like best friends and, her and I are getting closer. And then her daughter was um, actually Tegan um, in the, the movie. So the daughter of, of Clay. So I think she wanted, you know, to be there and, and just take care of us all. But I agree. She could totally make a <laughs> career into this. But I think her, her writing career is taking off so much that it would be hard to, to go back to... Um, you know, that customer service. <laughs> so, Tinelle, tell me the importance of your character in this movie. So my character is what I would call like a sleeper character. So, you know, there's something about her because she's so weird. Like there's got to be something, you know, but um, most people don't see it coming. So I don't want to do any spoiler alerts, but right. my character has definitely got a lot of layers. And I think that's where the makeup and the wardrobe, you know, was, was so important to kind of give some of those visual clues um, of what she actually is. Right. So, so definitely she's, you know, a key character, but because of the storyline, um, you don't see a lot of her in the trailer or in, you know, the promotional materials because we don't want to give anything away. Right, but, right. Um, but she was super fun to play. She was very um, multi-personality, I guess you would say. So, um, you know, just a lot of different uh, elements, you know, to, to bring out. And so it was, it was fun. I would say, my most fun was doing the um, the the staff meeting at Sunnydale when I was like walking back and forth. Oh, okay. and I was like, and the funny thing is, is I really didn't feel like I was acting um, because I can get that excited over, you know, stuff. And so, but everybody said it was so creepy. So I think it was like the makeup and, you know, how my eyelashes were and like the jewels. Yeah, and I think too eyes. that, you know, you don't want to feel like you're acting. You want to be being. So you were in right. that, you were in that 
You were in that, oh that's the acting. you were in that moment. So you weren't acting anymore. You right. knew what then, you had to do. You knew it. And then the your response. body just kind of takes over. Right. Right. And the response I was getting, cause I had four women on the other side of me and I was doing kind of a drill sergeant walk back and forth and they were like receiving it and giving it back. So, I mean, it was, we were just like that energy was just bouncing, you know, and it just kept building and it just, it, yeah, it, it made it like exciting. And so I just like, like I brought that out in the excitement for the new facility opening. And so, right. um, so yeah, so that was probably my most fun scene, but I definitely think the scene where Candace did, you know, all of the, the death makeup for, for Angel, that was cinematically, I think my, my favorite shot. So what was the most, so if I'm going to ask each one of you this, so what was your most difficult moment on set? I mean, it doesn't have to be anything like nothing personal, just for you personally. Oh, ooh, okay. I got one. I'll go okay, first. Okay, go. Go, Ken. Um, go. Being inside of Eloise. <laughs> what being now? Inside of, being inside of Eloise, uh, the asylum, like it was super creepy. Like you definitely felt the energy in that place. So that was kind of like difficult for me. But that's why I'm like, I had to give myself a pat on the back because I told myself I would never step foot on that place. But I definitely got through it, did what I had to do, and went home. <laughs> yeah, that, okay, that was Calhoun, what was your most difficult moment on set? Oh, I it's it's hard because for a lot of my scenes, my, my scene partner was was Dan Pesto, the, the, the lead actor, uh -huh. and w he made every single scene so yeah. easy because he was just such an amazing person to work with and it, it, like to neil said with the other scene like things just bounced and things just flowed and it was so effortless probably the most difficult is probably the scene at the medline where i kind of have almost like this i'm on the verge of like this panic attack really and and in the, the takes i was actually hyperventilating and i was getting like lightheaded between takes oh, no. and there were extras in the scene so it was like having to like reset around a bunch of people and have to go from like 0 to 100 in literally 4 seconds mm -hmm. <laughs> that was definitely I i'd say more physically challenging just kind of making sure i don't pass out <laughs> right and and it uh, is the job of the director to make the actor feel completely safe Right. So, it, so I think that, you know, and it does take a few takes to feel safe because it's like the first, even if you're ready, set, you've done all your homework as an actor, you know, then the, then you're, you know, you're, whole, you're literally burying your soul in front of all these people standing around with a camera. Yeah. In so I think that, <laughs> uh, I think those heavy duty scenes, those Oscar winning type performances is because you are given the opportunity and I don't think uh, a good director would even try to rush you. I'm sure he didn't because if he gave you all those different takes, I think, uh, and that's a, and it sounds like it was a very pivotal scene for you, at, you know, because your character's kind of arcing at that point. So I feel like uh, it's important that you're given that space to, you know, because, you know, and eventually if you're given that emotional moment, everybody else kinds of fades away and you're just in that moment. And that's yeah. when you know the director's done their job for you. Yeah, and I also really appreciated like Brandon on set during those moments because yes. he is such like yeah. he's the nicest guy, but he's also he will not hesitate to shut people down if they're stepping out of line. And yeah. there's, so who's there's Brandon? I, just, I went Brandon. Oh, who? I forgot his last name. What's his Brafka? last name? Brafka. He's that AB. Okay, yeah. just want to make sure that we give oh, him a shout out. I, hey, Brandon, go ahead. Yes, Talk Brandon, about Brandon again. <laughs> but yeah, there, there's like a there's a level of set etiquette that he's really good at enforcing without being a, a dick about it. Like he's the most loved AD <laughs> I've worked with because you know ADs are kind of known to be very intense and the enemies of the set in some ways. Well, I think they're so. just in charge of making sure everything runs smoothly <laughs> right. because that's their job because the director doesn't want to worry about that. They need somebody to, to handle all that because they're yeah. trying to get the art out, you know, and somebody else has got to make sure all the paperwork and all the shots are written down and they got to make sure everything else. So I get that. I totally mm -hmm. get that. And, and, and it's sometimes, awesome. I hate to say it, but sometimes you have to be dickish to do it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 a manager job. You, it's, you, know, it's what you have yeah. to do. Okay, Tanil, what is the most difficult thing for you, girl? Yes, I have one thing. Um, 
so I was super proud. We secured a really, really um, nice location next to the Tigers um, baseball field in Detroit. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, a big shout out to Tin Roof. They were very open and film friendly. They have an amazing rooftop bar that overlooks the, the stadium. Uh-huh. And, you know, I did my due diligence. There was no Tigers game that day, but they did say that there, you know, was a concert that night. And I was like, great, let's do it like from, you know, schedule wise from noon to two because we got a church in Detroit we got to go to. So we'll be in and out. So. Of course, lo and behold, the day before, I realized it's out in John. <laughs> and so I am like sweating bullets because I was like, you know, every time I went there, like parking was not a problem, you know, and I'm thinking like nobody's really going to show up to town until four or five, like after work. So I get downtown and he had to refigure out like a parking plan, but it all worked out. Um, and then the other thing that did happen was out and decided to do his sound check when we were halfway through. So oh. luckily we got our wide establishing and we got coverage on two of the actors. So we basically handled it with ADR, but it right. was just really disappointing because it was, you know, fairly expensive, you know, to be in that space and such a short window of time. And then that happens. I know we actually, I, when we ADR is a, pain. I, I don't even know. I think when you watch uh, television, a lot of times, sometimes you have to make sure you have those super wide shots so you don't see the people's mouth moving. Right. Because I had the same issue. So I had to, I literally worked so hard trying to fix the ADR on one freaking scene. Yeah. And eventually, you know, going to distribution, I had to cut it because the location was great. The actors were yeah. great. And then yeah. I had to cut them. And then I felt really bad because I had to, you know, because they're friends of mine. I'm like, hey, I had to cut your scene. I did yeah. everything I could. It had nothing to do with you, but I, I get that. ADR is really tough. So I think uh, when you have those big, like those, especially those quick uh, shoots, I think it, as a filmmaker, you probably would plan for doing some wide shots where you don't see their mouth moving. Right. I think it's, I, I'm pretty sure that's how television gets around. Yeah. That. Yep. Yep. So, yep. So we, we get our <laughs> wides first. Yep. So we've always got that establishing shot. So, um, so yeah, it was, that was a little stressful though, you know, <laughs> oh, because a little. Just, it was. You know, yep. So, so anyways, once we got past that location, you know, um, you know, everything went back on track, but, but that was definitely the, the biggest thing. But what I will say is kind of nice is, um, we have then after Clay, the lead, leaves the restaurant, he's like walking home because he's mad at his family. And so um, we get him walking underneath the Fox Theater, which is kind of a landmark in Detroit. And lo and behold, it does have the out and John yellow brick farewell tour or whatever. Oh. So I feel like it does kind of have like a little bit of a like a memory um you know, kind so, of. Do, but when, because it had that, are you, are you allowed to keep that in the film for your distribution? That was not flagged. Oh, okay. There's well, that's good. Yeah. So be right. So basically it was a shot that we had gotten. Yeah. But yeah. yeah but I, but, you know, when you put it through the, you know, through the right. mill, a lot of right, times. Right. Yeah. Flag, you know what so. that, that it hasn't that I mean it was like so minuscule maybe like it's not maybe they didn't catch legible it legible enough right but yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, nobody said anything well that's good that's great yeah I think that a lot of times too I mean when you think about it it just advertises Elton John's show right <laughs> right absolutely that, right so yeah. it's kind of like free advertisement so I, this has been really fun. I know we're running out of time. I want to make sure that you guys stay in the studio after the show uh, so uh, he can make sure that everything's kind of good. But I I think you, you're very three powerful women. I think you guys are doing a fantastic job. I'm super excited to watch the movie. I'm going to go sit down and probably watch it right now because I have the day off. And get I your would, popcorn. Get my yeah. popcorn. And I wanted to recommend this movie to everybody chasing the ghost because i do believe that drug addiction is very important and i think it's kind of fun that you made it kind of a fun film with a with a very uh disturbing backdrop mm -hmm. right so yeah. it, That's a good I, I think it. it's you know so i think it sounds like a great mix we're gonna have the trailer below 
Um, and then anything that if you wanted to get a hold of Tennille or Calhoun or Candace for your next feature, please get, please let them please give them a call and tell them that you saw them on Real Women. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate. It.